Hello guys, how are you? My name is Alexandre Borges, and I'm talking about the obfuscation uh, on modern malwares. It's a very nice, uh, interesting uh, stuff to talk about. Of course, uh, my first language is not uh, English, and neither Dutch. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I hope that you enjoy my presentation. It's uh, my short profile here. And uh, here we have our agenda about the topics that will be commented on this talk. Uh, let's, let's start. Uh, we'll talk about uh, anti-reversing. Uh, nowadays, most malware have been using obfuscation uh, to protect uh, the software, to protect uh, the uh, code. But uh, I believe that in most cases, uh, the obfuscations uh, have been using uh, to protect intellectual property and mainly using in malwares. Malware threats, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, hot stuff uh, around the world and uh, some guys believe that uh, obfuscation is able to hide or protect the code. Uh, okay. We know that it, it's not true. Uh, obfuscation only uh, by some time make our, our lives uh, uh, harder to reverse the code, but uh, only that. Uh, obfuscation by some time uh, demands some resources to make the reverse path, but so, it's only that. Uh, every single day we have uh, been uh, analyzing uh, different kind of malware threats using, uh, for example, VBA, PowerShell, uh, and things like that. But in this case, uh, this kind of malware is using very basic obfuscate techniques and sophisticated malwares, uh, mainly this kind of malware that I will comment here, uh, use very complicated uh, techniques. Of course, uh, we can uh, use the IDA Pro SDK to write plugins every single day to extend uh, its functionalities, to uh, analyze some uh, code and the data flow. We can try to automate a, a process, a, a unpacking process, and mainly we can uh, write loaders uh, to analyze, for example, MBR code. Uh, MBR code is a kind of uh, interesting code uh, because uh, current malware is trying to infect MBR and UFI uh, to compromise the systems and, and platform. Unfortunately for us, uh, more, uh, most packers and protectors like Temida, like VM Protect, SharkSan, and Agile.net use uh, very hard uh, obfuscation techniques. And uh, our job is to try to reverse and handle this kind of complexity. Uh, this kind of code, this kind of protectors usually uh, I used in 64 uh, code and malware too. Usually, uh, these malware try to remove the import to others table, uh, similar uh, to any kind of malware. Uh, this kind of protections try to encrypt and obfuscation strings. Uh, most time, uh, the the strings are are encrypted. Uh, this kind of protectors trying to check the memory integrity, for, for, for example, it's very difficult, it's very hard to dump uh, the malware from the memory using volatility, because most time uh, we don't have uh, all the instructions uh, encrypted, so uh, uh, this technique makes it uh, almost impossible to dump malware from memory. Uh, additionally, uh, 
packers similar to Temida, VM Protect, and things like that, use uh, a kind of virtualization. So we have the following situation. We, we have uh, some x86 instructions translated to a very specific and protect uh, VM code. So uh, it's uh, so hard because uh, this kind of uh, virtual machine is running uh, risk instructions. So imagine, I have a x86 code translated to a virtual machine code using risk. And worst, uh, sometimes I have one instruction being translated to four, five, eight different instructions. So I don't have a kind of map from one instruction to another instruction. Sometimes I have one instruction being translated to very different instructions inside the VM uh, virtual machine code. Uh, when you use .NET protectors, example, protectors such as agile.net, these guys try to rename classes, methods, fields, and, ex and external uh, reference. So, make our lives so difficult. Some packers, as I mentioned it, try to encrypt the instructions. So, we have a very complicated scenario because I have uh, x86 uh, x8, uh, instruction being translated to a virtual instruction and this instruction is encrypted on the memory. So uh, we, we need to decrypt these instructions and reverse the process to find the original instructions. Uh, it's a very time consuming work and job and I believe that uh, it takes some time to do that. Uh, most packers, most protectors are based on stack. So it's, uh, this kind of technique uh, makes uh, almost impossible uh, to handle virtualized code aesthetically. So you need to uh, make or use some kind of emulation trick or even a dynamic emulation trick. Most of these codes are polymorphic. So, uh, as I told you, I have one instruction being translated to several different instructions. Uh, it's not possible to uh, make a map uh, from the x86 instruction to the virtualized instruction. These protectors also uh, insert lots of push instructions because my protection is based on the stack, so there are lots of push instructions make or oh, oh, performing f fake pushing in the stack, so make our job a bit harder. We have, we also have lots of that code, usually code, to try to uh, mess our code too. There are lots of uh, code reordering. Uh, for, for example, using many unconditional, uh, unconditional jumps. So it's a kind of spaghetti code. Uh, you know, reverse sophisticated protectors like Temida, like uh, VM Protects, is so difficult. There are lots of tricks being used. And we try to use different techniques, different tricks to handle them. All of these protectors also use code flattening. Uh, code flattening is something like that. For example, I have a linear execution, and code flattening try to create a branch of execution using uh, different uh, co conditionals to make uh, the reversing job harder. 
It's a small scheme here. For example, I have uh, x86 uh, x86 uh, function being virtualized by a protector. And inside the virtual machine, the, in the special virtual machine, we have a handler. So for each uh, x86 instruction, I have a handler uh, trying to modify and process these instructions. So uh, we need to make the reverse process trying to uh, uh, revert from the Vibertos instruction to x86, uh, to x86 instruction. So, therefore, our job basically is, our job not, uh, the job from uh, the virtualizer is to fetch instruction, decode it because most of them are encrypted, and after that, find a handler and execute this handler. So you can imagine, you can think about uh, virtual machines in this case as a kind of set of handlers, uh, one or, or more handler uh, trying to process uh, x86 instructions. And there are several kind of tricks being used inside this kind of protectors. For example, constant unfolding. Basically, this technique uh, tries to replace a constant by a bunch of code, uh, which results in the same constant. Pattern-based obfuscation, trying to exchange one instruction by a set of equivalent instructions. We have, for example, many inline functions being called from the virtualized code. We have many anti-VM techniques, obviously. Uh, we have dead code, tons of dead code there. And we have code duplication. In this case, it's very specific because I have different brands of code uh, arrive at the same point. Uh, this technique uh, trying to make some confusion in our minds. We have some kind of indirection, control indirection. For example, here, a uh, call instruction try to update the stack pointer, and in the return point, uh, it's a kind of uh, trick to skip some instructions, so uh, make this instruction dead. We have different kind of uh, ex exception manipulation there, and mainly opaque, pre opaque predicate. Uh, in this case, it's very crucial because we have uh, different uh, we have different conditions. For for example, we have two or more evaluations using jump if zero or jump if not zero, back to back. Uh, the code try to uh, try to deceive us uh, to believe that there are a kind of decision, but at the end, uh, both conditions are are a kind of uh, uh, unconditional jump. Uh, so we have two different branches, but only one branch is taken and the other branch is dead. Of course, we have lots of anti-debugging techniques uh, to bypass, and we have some polymorphism. And, uh, most of these protectors try to use self-modification code, uh, like shell codes, uh, to modify the code during the uh, runtime. Well, we have uh, some call stack manipulation too, uh, to try to uh, create several fake return points. Uh, so uh, this kind of uh, protection try to hide uh, the real return uh, point, uh, inserting several uh, different fake return points there. 
It's, uh, it's possible to handle this kind of tricks and obfuscation. Yes, it, it, it's possible. For example, we have reverse re recursive substitution uh, using metasm, and we have symbolic equation system also using metasm and miasm. Uh, obviously, uh, we have very good plugins in IDA Pro using, for, for example, code unvirtualizer, we have VM attack, we have VM sweep, uh, and every single plugin try to help us to re reverse this kind of code. Uh, my intention here is try to It's I should show you a easy uh, obfuscation code and try to revert it. For example, imagine this situation. I have only one instruction, edge EAX, ECX. This simple instruction can be converted to the second case to the third case to the fourth case. The question is, this only instruction is equal to this, this, and this. How can I revert this uh, from stage four to stage one? This kind of... Uh, method, this, this kind of trick is seen in every single sophisticated model that I analyze every single day. Here we have some possible tricks, we have some possible uh, techniques, possible frameworks to do that. One of them is Metasm. Metasm is a great framework that works as a disassembler, uh, an assembler, compiler, linker. Here, uh, I show you that Metasm is written in Ruby. Uh, it performs backtracing. Uh, it supports uh, several kinds of platforms. And it supports several kinds of formats. I show you here uh, how to install Metasm. And let's go. I insert our code from stage four here. So I try to initialize Metasm. I insert our code here. This code is exactly the same code. I start the disassembly engine here and Disassembly from the address zero. Here, I started the backtrace engine because Metasm works uh, trying to execute the code from the bottom to the beginning and making a hypothesis. And here, I try to determine what's the effective instruction that the, this entire code. So, I try to lock some execution here, and here I try to show the effective instruction uh, which might alter the final result. You see, it's a very simple code. I executed here. At the beginning of the execution, Metasm shows us our disassembly code. Execute instruction by instruction, showing us the registers, 
step by step in green. And at the end, Metasme shows us that e or instruction, all of these instructions results in only EAX plus ECX. As I show you, uh, we can. I will try to. I will try to do a little demo here. Here, you, you see that our code is the same code, okay? And we can execute it. As you see, our final result is here. All of this code results in EAX plus ECX. Return here. Uh, the second part of our program show the effective instructions here. So uh, only these instructions try to alter the final result in our program. Additionally, I will show you the, uh, that another te te technique. For, for example, here, e emulation. Emulation is a very nice trick to be used every single day, but uh, emulation uh, has a different approach of metasm, but uh, works so well. For example, here I use uh, UEMU from it, it's a kind of plugin from Ida Pro uh, together with Keystone uh, Engine and Capstone Engineer here. So uh, I show you uh, how to install Keystone uh, Engine here. It's so easy. And once more, I try to show you a little piece of code uh, written in C language. So try to understand. I define a, a macro here. What mean all the code to be deobfuscated? Here, I define and create uh, my Keystone engine. Here, I try to make the disassembly, the assembly instruction. In, in, and here, I try to free the memory. I, I, I'm using a very simple make file here. I compiled our program here, and I executed it. So, these instructions result in this Xcode. I saved this Xcode in a file named Hack in the Box 2019 and open inside the IDA Pro. So now I I'm, I have our code to be emulated using other techniques. In this case, I can try to revert. For example, I can I can confirm that this code here means these instructions using capstone. So I written a simple code in C language, define our code here in X 
decimal uh, using capstone, and if you run, you you have the same code. So I open our code in UMU. UMU is a kind of plugin to Ida Pro. You can download it from here. Install. You need to install Unicorn Engine. And uh, when you install the UMU plugin, you can open our, our code, define the values of each register, in our case, EX1, ECX6, and try to emulate when you start the emulation. ECX is equal to seven. Why? Because our code uh, at EAX plus ECX. I tried to use Miasmi too. Miasmi is an excellent frame, framework. Excellent. Uh, Miasmi supports assembly, disassembly, several kind of different platforms, and mainly allows me to emulate code by using JIT. I show you how to install Miasmi here. I made a kind of simple test using a, a sample from Miasm. So this simple test, I try on a shell code, uh, and I plot a graph here. So let's to try to focus on our code. You see. I open our, our code uh, made by Keystone here. I chose x 32 emulation. I disassembled our code here. I used the WLVM jitter engine. I set up uh, the initial address to this address. I set up the EAX to one, GECX to six. I add a breakpoint in our code. Uh, the breakpoint, the breakpoint is on this address or uh, the start address uh, plus the size. And finally, I run the emulation, make a graph. Here, metasm execution. Sorry, miasm execution here. Disassemble our code. Execute step by step in red here. And finally, our result EAX is equal EAX plus ECX. Uh, here it's our graph. But uh, this kind of uh, execution is based on numerical values. Uh, the more instance, uh, the more, uh, the, 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 uh, I believe that there is a most interesting uh, approach that using symbolic execution. So using the same miasm here, I open our code, hit a uh, hacking in the box 2009ams.bin. I start a machine engine here using x86 32 code. I disassemble our code here. And here, exactly at this point, I started our symbolic machine execution. As you see, you can see each instruction being executed one by one in yellow here with uh, all the registers, and, and at the end, we have our result. EAX is equal to the initial EAX plus ECX. Uh, this kind of trick is so nice to the obfuscation codes. Of course, I, choose, uh, I chose a very basic code here, 
but uh, in the daily job, there are many complicated situations and issues that we have to handle, but uh, that's it. Now, let's uh, talk about BIOS and UFI threats. Since Windows Vista, basically uh, the main protection against rootkits is based on KCS, kernel mode code signing policy. KCS is amazing to prevent uh, against any kind of unsigned kernel model. Uh, that's okay, works so well. However, uh, most, uh, uh, most uh, malwares trying to attack uh, a point before KCS is being running. So, KCS tried to uh, uh, check all kind of uh, uh, driver signature, and basically uh, the main goals of rootkits uh, is, tr is uh, to bypass KCS by disabling it, by uh, exploit some vulnerability, uh, by using driving with uh, some kind of valid certification from, from another vendor, and trying to uh, disassemble security boot. Uh, so there are lots of techniques to bypass K KCS nowadays, and all of them uh, are being used uh, uh, by advanced malwares. Code integrity. Uh, can be disabled by uh, changing only one BCD variable in Windows uh, uh, 7. And uh, uh, since that, uh, security boot uh, is disabled. Uh, so, most malware uh, threats, or so most BIOS and UFI threats, uh, try to attack early stages uh, be before KCS, because KCS is only so effective against rootkits, but is not effective against uh, bootkits. Uh, since Windows 8, we, uh, Windows 8 and Windows 10, uh, the code integrity can be disabled to only change one variable, because there are lots of counter variables uh, acting uh, to, uh, to force the KCS. So, uh, now, the code integrity is so hard to bypass, and uh, malwares have been using different techniques to do that. So, KCS is not able to fight against bootkits. KCS is amazing against rootkits uh, that use uh, any kind of uh, malicious driver but it's not effective against uh, bootkits. So, in this case, we have the security boot to help us, because of the security boot. Check the integrity of Windows boot files and UFI components, and mainly, check the bootload integrity. So, uh, during the boot process, we have the KCS acting uh, on the driver loading, but before this point, we have to use a, a different protection. In, in this case, we, uh, we can use security boot to do that. Uh, on Windows 10, mainly, the, uh, we have a uh, improved protection named Virtual Security Mode, VSM. It's a kind of isolation uh, between system files, critical files, and user files. So uh, now, non-critical drives uh, are not able to disable the integrity, uh, the, the integrity checking because they run in, in a different place, in a different container on Windows 10. As you know, VSM is composed by a local security authority, a kernel mode code integrity, and a hypervisor code integrity 2 in Windows 10. Finally, we have the device guard that is composed by 
CCI, VSM, and finally, the main point here, the platform and UFI security boot, which protects us against UFI and boot components uh, by using digital signature. Unfortunately, to use the advantages of device guard, or drivers need, uh, or drives cannot load data as executable code, can alter anything on the system memory, and uh, can uh, be executable or writable at the same time. Unfortunately, malwares uh, don't follow this procedure, these rules. So uh, malwares uh, uh, don't, uh, don't work in, on systems uh, using device guard. Windows also offers uh, ELA, Early Launch Anti-Malware uh, uh, Protection. Basically, ELA is based on callback methods, so which monitors drivers and registers. ELA can classify drivers in good, bad, and unknown. Basically, based on the image's name, hash, hash location, certification issuer or publisher. Uh, there are four different policies to ELA. Basically, we, uh, basically uh, the default one is enough because the, def be, uh, because the default one allows to load bad critical drivers, but not uh, allows to load uh, non-critical drivers. So in this case, uh, uh, the default policy is enough to detect malwares, but uh, it not... Uh, it doesn't prevent the Windows machine to boot. Once more, Elan is excellent against root kits, but it's not appropriate to boot kits. Why? Because Elan only is running after Winload Z start uh, its execution. In legacy systems, we have different kind of ways to co compromise the system. For, for, for example, we can uh, try to compromise the MBR. We can to compromise the VBR. In this case, malware try to change the, uh, the uh, IPL address to load a malicious code by using a very specific field named hiding sectors. So in this case, hiding sectors is inside to BBP. BBP is a BIOS by parameter block, BBP. And uh, the malware try to change this field to load a uh, malicious code instead of loading the IPL. Uh, most time, this malicious code uh, could be loaded from a hiding uh, uh, file system, normally, or in the beginning of the disk, or in the end of the disk, and, and this code is encrypted uh, most time. More, so we know that co compromise the IPL could cause a, a possibility of a loading a malicious code from, uh, from a hiding storage instead of loading the boot manager model. The malicious IPL uh, could load a malicious kernel drive during this process, and worse, uh, most of the malicious IPL uh, code that I've been, uh, I've been seeing are polymorphic. Here you see our hiding sector from, B, from BBP, and most threats try to change this field to execute another code 
a malicious code instead of execution the IPL. Once the boot uh, main manager model is loaded, the Mars goal is try to circumvent the code integrity verification. In this case, in, in this specific case, the code integrity uh, is handled by the boot manager and we load Z. Uh, so the goal uh, of each malware is trying to circumvent both ones. Uh, once the code integrity checking has been disabled, so it's possible to replace any important code, any important file from the boot components like kgcon.dll to compromise the systems. Pay attention here. Uh, modern malwares trying to compromise very fundamental and essential uh, disk services from BIOS, like extend read, extend write, and mainly get drive parameters. More, most driver or most uh, uh, malware trying to subvert this specific interruption in that thing. Uh, that uh, uh, that's a very essential. In Interruption uh, responsible from responsible by any kind of read and write operation, and trying to co compromise the boot manager, the winload Z, and the kernel too. Here, I try to show a very simple way, a very simple trick to analyze uh, infected MBR. Uh, I extracted the MBR from the disk and I disassembled using IDA Pro. Remember, MBR uh, runs uh, in 16 bit code. So here we have a clean MBR and here we have an infected MBR, in this case from Petya. We can now uh, try to convert, uh, to, to infect a virtual machine code, uh, used for, for example, Petya. Convert uh, the virtual machine disk to a raw disk. Extract uh, the MBR from there. And use box, for, for example, to, to emulate this code here. I, I show you a very simple box file configuration. The main points uh, are in yellow here. And I show you how to start the box emulation machine here. So uh, I set up the breakpoint in the classical MBR, MBR uh, start point. I list the breakpoint, I start the code, and I disassemble the code when I need. Here, by hitting S, I can execute MBR step-by-step, uh, -step, uh, instruction by instruction. Here, I show you uh, the infected MBR code being a debugged by IDA Pro. And I try to show a different approach here. Uh, we, can, we can try to analyze an infected MBI code by using IDA Pro uh, uh, from different ways. In this case, you can download this script uh, from this website. Edit it, uh, mainly here, uh, the last two lines to point to your infect MBR. And that's it. Another much better uh, approach 
is trying to use the debugger inside inside the VMware uh, workstation. So you need to change the VMX configuration by uh, inserting these points in in orange here. Power the virtual machine. So you you launch the IDA Pro, go to debugger, attach, remote GDB debugger. Set up some settings here. Local machine in, in this specific port. Attach to your process. Go to views, open subviews, segments, and try to edit segments, changing from 32 bit to, six, to 16 bit code. Uh, here. Clicking OK. Set a breakpoint at start of MBR. Choose enabled and hard breakpoint. And that's it. You are able to debug a live MBR, a live infect MBR by using uh, GDB and IDA Pro. Here is a complete overview about our topics. That's the sequence. Uh, we have the BIOS, executing after MBR, VBR, IPL, the boot, the boot manager, or if you are using UFI machine, you EFI, boot manager, EFI. Uh, after that, you execute the BCG, WinLoad Z. WinLoad Z, uh, it's a preference, it's a preferred uh, uh, target to, to uh, boot kits. And this, this guy starts several components uh, checking uh, the integrity and, for example, using Elan in this case. Most modern malware try to manipulate the driver stack. So, as you know, most drivers are developed using a pair of drivers, a class drivers and a, and a mid driver here. Uh, and most kind of, in uh, most different uh, monitors, programs, trying to monitor uh, this stack. But most, but most of uh, malicious drivers call IO call driver function to bypass all of these uh, components, all of these drivers uh, that are being monitored and trying to access directly the filter driver here. So, making all the monitoration useless. Another possible trick here is try to hook in this, this handler uh, MG, MG internal control handler uh, to manipulate the data flow uh, to the disk. Most boot kits and root, and root kits, mainly root kits, try to use callback methods. Callback methods is a kind of modern hooking technique. Callback methods allows to uh, be notified when a process or kernel uh, uh, model is mapped into memory, uh, allows to be notified when a thread starts, when the system to shut down. Here, uh, allows to uh, receive any kind of notification uh, before a shutdown, uh, allows you to uh, be notified when a process starts or finish, and mainly this, this technique is well known. Uh, nowadays, 
most modern malwares try to use callback methods to keep the persistence. For example, when you try to change or to remove the persistence of the malware from the registry, a, call, a callback method is called, and the malware is able to put back its entry there. So it's almost impossible to uh, change the register uh, uh, without using any kind of special trick here. Some malwares have been compromised this interruption, interruption one, because this interruption one is responsible for handling debug events. Some malwares try to hide uh, the information here in hiding partitions in FAFA system. Other malware try to hook the drive unload function uh, to prevent anyone to unload the malicious model. Some malware try to use this specific API and it erases the hard error to force a reboot to load uh, a, ma a malicious driver. And few malwares have been using this technique, uh, hooking and using uh, int 19 interruptions to load an infected MBR into the, mem into the memory. Uh, legacy systems didn't, didn't have any kind of standard, so it was so difficult to infect them. Nowadays, using UFI systems is much easier because there is a standard. Uh, we don't have MBR, VBR, e IPL anymore. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's uh, simpler than before. UFI is stored in a SPI flash. Uh, you are able to dump the SPI flash using hardware or software. And most, and most of this code is run in protect mode, different from MBR. So in this case, uh, current malware uh, have been trying to attack this specific and new bootloader. Uh, boot mgfw uh, dot e e ufi because this guy is responsible is responsible to locate to locate this guy win load uh, dot e f i kernel loader since windows 8 thanks god uh, there are uh, support to ufi security boot don't make a mess UFI Secure Boot is different from OS Secure Boot. UFI Secure Boot protects us, protect uh, the boot components, for example, OS bootloaders, UFI GXZ drivers, and so on, for, from any kind of modification. So in, in this case, uh, uh, the UFI Secure Boot is so effective to protect the boot component, the boot process, but it's not effective to protect against any kind of uh, firmware infection. The UFI Secure Boot is based on PKI on PK, uh, to validate UFI models, so all, uh, all of these pre-protection is based on digital certificates. Unfortunately, recently, I discovered that uh, this approach doesn't work with terse executable because this kind of specific format uh, not supports uh, the embedded uh, uh, digital signature. So uh, if I don't have digital signature, so I don't have how uh, to protect uh, the code using uh, the certified uh, uh, the sign, uh, the sign techniques. UFI Secure Boot is composed by several components, 
in this case, platform key. The platform key, uh, in this case, uh, establish a relationship between the platform owner uh, uh, and the platform firmware. Uh, this platform key verify the CAC, uh, key, uh, K-E key, key, key exchange key. The CAC uh, establish a relationship B between the platform fir firmware and OS. So we have a relationship be between the platform owner and, and the platform firmware, and after that, uh, be between the platform firmware and OS. The CAC try to verify two databases, DB and DBX. The DB contains uh, authorized sign certificates and digital signatures, and DBX contains forbidden certificates and digital signatures here. Of course, uh, if the platform key is corrupted, automatically the security boots turns out disabled. There are two other databases named GBR, GBR, and GBT. GBR contains the public uh, key used to validate the OS Rick Overloader signatures, and GBT contains uh, basically the timestamp to avoid, to prevent using any kind of uh, expired certificates. As you can see, all of the protection is based on integrity of the SPI flash. Of course, uh, if the SPI flash is compromised, everything else is compromised too. Uh, most malwares have been trying to modify the SPI flash content. Why? Because doing that, it's possible to disable the Security boot true. So uh, nowadays we uh, we have to use uh, different tricks to protect the SPI flash. In this case, there are uh, some techniques, some new protections to protect the SPI. Verified boot, uh, we, uh, which uh, checks the platform firmware and mainly the measured boot uh, that uh, get hash from the boot, boot components and stores in TTPM. The basic process here uh, to boot a UFI machine is composed by G sequence, SEC, PEI, GXD, G, uh, BDS, TLS, uh, TSL, RT, NLL, that it's here, but the Main points, the main components are BGS and GXZ that are responsible for find the boot loader to boot our system. You, you must remember uh, some key points about SMM. SMM is a kind of God mode. Uh, uh, so it's a very interesting place to hide malwares because uh, uh, it's protected from OS and hypervisors. The SMM executable code uh, basically is copied uh, to SMM uh, and locked there to uh, make the initialization. To switch uh, to SMM, it's necessary uh, uh, to trigger a SMI trigger, a, a SMI handler, system manager uh, in, in the handler, uh, to make this transition. Uh, and as you know, the SMI handler is a kind of interface between OS and hardware too. So most time, I've been seeing uh, uh, some models trying to compromise the SMM driver in in this case, to gain the SM privilege and from there to disable the flash protection to infect a DXZ uh, driver. So uh, the common path it try to execute a user length code running a driver 
as a root kit to escalate to SMM to compromise the SPI flash in your machine. Uh, once the OS security boot is disabled, you can manipulate everything in your machine because the patch guard, which protects several areas, uh, and you find them uh, by executing this command on WinDBG, uh, the patch guard only uh, run after the boot process. So it's a very problem for, for us. What else? So we have the OS security boot trying to protect uh, our drivers. Before that, we have the UFI security boot trying to prevent any kind of attack to modify uh, components before the OS stage. Before, before UFI uh, security boot, we have the boot guard. The boot guard is a very efficient uh, technique to protect uh, our machine based on keys. And before this point, we have the BIOS guard, uh, which tries to guarantee the integrity of the BIOS. I'm almost finishing. The boot guard it's amazing to verify the boot process by flashing a very specific uh, public key uh, associated to the BIOS signature into uh, FPF, Field Programmer Fuses. Uh, this is a kind of uh, hardware inside the processor, in, inside the, the, the flash. Is a perfect solution? I'm, I don't think so, because some uh, vendors have been uh, leaving these fuses unset, so it's possible to allow malware to change these fuses and, and infect our systems. And, uh, additionally, most more modern uh, malwares have been trying to flash uh, a new code uh, into the SPI flash uh, uh, component, trying to compromise the whole machine. What else? So, the boot guard tries to protect the boot process, and the BIOS guard tries to protect the entire platform against any, any kind of uh, malware trying to infect us. This is a very specific picture uh, where the CPU loads the wrong. The boot guards run the ACM, which, ver which ver verify the IBB, initial boot block. Uh, the IBB ver verify the BIOS content. It's a kind of certificate chain checking. Uh, each, uh, each stage checking the next one. So, the BIOS guard try to protect us the, uh, against any kind of malware trying to infect the platform. So uh, the BIOS guard tries to protect the SPI flex access and mainly the BIOS update. Uh, so it's a perfect protection against implants. Here I show you a complete uh, scheme a complete picture, step by step, since the flash, passing uh, by several uh, UFI components, boot our system until our applications here. Here, I'm using the UFI tool uh, to analyze um, SPI flash, and using the same tool uh, to analyze a uh, BIOS update. It's uh, amazing because most time I've been, uh, I've been seeing uh, malware trying to change GGXZ drivers here. So it's possible to uh, extract and analyze it in the IDA Pro. 
We have uh, some legacy protections too, uh, protecting us uh, in different ways. For, for example, here we, we have SMM uh, BWP uh, that protects us uh, against uh, malware trying to change the firmware outside of the SMM. We have malware trying to uh, uh, we have uh, some other kind of protection here, BLE, uh, BIOS WE, and mainly protect ranges. That uh, it's the stronger protections using to protect the legacy uh, firmware. Here, I show you uh, how to dump uh, a SPI in your machine by using chipset. Here is a critical case. Uh, the BIOS of these systems are unprotected against read-write execution, read-write operations. Here, uh, we have that SMM BWP, uh, that means SMM BIOS write preprotection is disabled, is horrible too. Our write protection registers are disabled too. So in, in this case, I found a uh, infected machine because these settings are not uh, set up before. Finally, we have here uh, good news because the flash cool configuration lockdown is enabled. So uh, the, the memory uh, could uh, disable the SPI protection ranges. Uh, and it's a good news. And here, I found a case recently about that. The malware tried to reset, uh, reset uh, 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 the, the vector of execution of the backup boot block to load an alternative boot block uh, uh, code. Uh, and this boot block code was infected. Why? Because the machine uh, uh, in the context was in, uh, uh, wasn't using, uh, was using uh, this kind of protections uh, against top swap mode. Here, we have a perfect protection against SMM uh, uh, malwares trying to uh, change uh, the SMM code. And finally, I show you uh, the complete components of your SPI flash uh, for your research. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Alexander? No questions? Okay, then it's time to uh, for the coffee break. It's last till half past four, and then we continue here again. Give a warm applause again for Alexander.